Let's make a start, shall we? Good evening, everyone. Good to see you all. Let's just come to God in prayer, shall we? Let's all pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together as your people. We thank you for your word. And we pray that as we uh, read your word together and uh, study it together, that you would help us to understand what we read. Not just head knowledge, Lord, but that it would move our hearts and our minds uh, to live lives which are worthy of the gospel of which we are called. So we commit our time now into your hands and we pray for your blessing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, this is the third uh, in the series of looking at what we call the Twelve, the Twelve Prophets uh, at the end uh, of the Old Testament. And um, we've, we're not looking at them in the order that they appear in the Scriptures, but we're looking at them as best we can ascertain in the chrono- chronological order, uh, the order in which they were written. And, and the reason for doing that is because uh, I think that as we uh, go through them in the order that they were written, it helps us to set them in their context, in their background, in their history, um, but also we're beginning to see that there's a thread that runs through the books. Uh, we first looked at uh, Obadiah, um, which uh, is probably the first one written uh, of the of the twelve, uh, and from there uh, he concludes his uh, prophecy with a reference to the day of the Lord. Uh, this phrase is picked up and expanded by Joel in the next of the books of the Twelve. Um, and then he, in turn, um, finishes his prophecy with a reference to uh, the roaring of the lion, or the lion roars. And uh, Amos, the third in the series, and the third um, written uh, in order, uh, picks up on that theme. So although the thread is not the same, there is a thread and they have a linkage one with another. And it almost seems that uh, one is kind of passing the baton on to to the next one. So one is called, he gives his message, he then uh, lays something down which the next one picks up and gives his message and so on. And so whether that will continue all the way through, we'll we'll, we'll wait to see. But but so far, um, this is what we've, we've found. So this is why we're going to look at Amos uh, tonight. Uh, before we get into that, uh, again, we just need to examine the background uh, and the context of Amos uh, and to see where his prophecy uh, fits into the timeline uh, of the story of Israel and Judah. Uh, I think I said last time that a useful date to have in our minds and to try and keep it there if we can is the year 931 BC. It's not a very memorable set of numbers, 931, uh, but that's the year when the kingdom of Israel uh, split into two. You have the uh, ten tribes of the north, which became known as Israel, and the two tribes of the south, which became known as Judah. Uh, That happened in 931 BC. And uh, it's then that uh, we we can begin, if you like, to look at the the timeline of these two nations. Uh, Obadiah, the first book that we've written, uh, that we've looked at, was written, we've said, around 840 BC, so about 90 years later. Joel, 20 years after that. Uh, Amos is a little harder to pin down an exact date, as we'll see in a minute. But what's happened is that in Joel's time, uh, Joel's prophecy, Joash had become king in 835 BC. He reigned for 40 years and was succeeded by Amaziah in 7. 96, and it's in Amaziah's reign uh, that Elisha uh, dies uh, and bringing to the end of that kind of era of the prophets. But uh, Amaziah appears to have been co-regent with his father Joash for 14 years because we're told he lived for 15 years after Joash died in 2 Chronicles 25, 25. Uh, And sometimes they're difficult to spot these kind of co-regencies. The reigns sometimes overlap. But after Amaziah was killed by conspirators, the 16-year-old Uzziah was crowned in 790. He's one that we're more likely to be a bit familiar with. And Uzziah reigned 52 years, the longest reigning king, I think, uh, in the south. Or maybe Manasseh might have been a little longer. Uh, In the north, we have another very long reigning king, Jeroboam II. Uh, He reigned for 41 years, becoming king in around 793 BC. So uh, it's in those reigns that Amos tells us, uh, in Amos chapter 1, verse 1, the words of Amos, uh, which he saw concerning Israel, 
in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel. So we have a 37-year time frame in which Amos delivers his prophecy. Uh, and uh, that's really all uh, that we have. But to his readers, it was very clear when he wrote it, because in verse 1 we read uh, that he, um, these words came uh, two years before the earthquake. Uh, now that's quite puzzling for us because we don't have any reference to the earthquake at all in either the Kings or the uh, Chronicles, but it is referred to uh, by Zechariah about 250 years later. And uh, I imagine that that's uh, because an earthquake um, you know, of some magnitude does incredible damage. Um, as you know, we, we popped over to, to Lisbon to uh, share a holiday with Hannah and Hassan a, a little while ago. The first thing the taxi driver is talking about from the airport is the earthquake. Have you heard about the earthquake? No. When, when did the earthquake happen? Oh, 100 years ago. You know, it's still kind of ingrained in the history of Portugal and in particular the, the history of Lisbon. And, and it had a tsunami afterwards and so on. So um, something like an earthquake... Um, sticks in, in the mind uh, and in the memory books. Um, there was one in Peldon, uh, in, uh, near Colchester, uh, in, in the 1800s, and, and there's still lots of information about that and what it did to the Peldon Rose and so on. So it clearly uh, was something that ingrained itself on the psyche, but it's not dated for us. So the, the original readers would have known when uh, Amos spoke. Um, presumably he wrote his words uh, that he was given after the earthquake, because otherwise, how would he have known it was two years before the earthquake? But uh, uh, we'll leave that uh, as it is. So that's a kind of time frame for when the book was written. Uh, interestingly, if you turn to Amos 1, verse 1, um, who was Amos? Who is this man whose prophecy we are reading? Uh, and uh, Amos 1, verse 1 says, The words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders, or herdsmen, um, some um, translations have it, uh, of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of uh, Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So there's actually quite a lot of information uh, that we're given in those two verses. The first thing is Amos, uh, we've talked about names and their significance, his name means burden bearer um, or burdensome. Um, and again, you can't imagine your, you know, the parents of, you know, the child, you know, uh, as he was born, going, what should we call our lovely little baby? Well, let's call him burdensome, you know. Um, but that was his name. So uh, how that come to be, we're not really quite sure. But he tells us later on in the book that he's not one of Elisha's school uh, of prophets. He doesn't come from that school. He hasn't been to the school of prophets, nor had his father been to the school of prophets. So he was not. Um, you, they would never use this word, but he's not a professional prophet in that sense. He's not making a life out of it. By this time, we know of the schools of the prophets. We know later on that they were called guilds of the prophets, both in Samaria and in uh, Jerusalem. But he's not one of those. He is just a shepherd. But he seems to be a poor shepherd. There, there's quite a bit of uh, debate as to whether this word sheep breeders is uh, like an overseer of sheep or whether he really is just a shepherd. But the fact that he lives in Tekoa uh, uh, is interesting, and the fact that he uh, uh, looks after a sycamore fruit, which we, we find uh, later on. Um, and he's a gatherer of sycamore fruit. Now, this sycamore fruit grew mainly in the lowland plains of Judea, it seems. And it was uh, a fruit that was eaten by the poorest people. It was a fig-like fruit. But you couldn't just pick it and eat it. You had to kind of climb the tree and pinch it or pierce it and let it ripen. So it, it, was, it was not something that was worthwhile doing unless, of course, uh, you uh, were hungry. Now, Amos comes from Tekoa, he tells us. Tekoa is five miles southeast of Bethlehem and uh, 12 miles south of Jerusalem. So it's, it's right down in the south. Uh, and of course, we read in verse 1, he sent to Israel. So he sent uh, to preach to the people in the north. Uh, and so the picture that we have then of Amos uh, is that he lives as a shepherd in this area of Tekoa. Tekoa is a wilderness area. Um, it doesn't have any houses. The word Tekoa um, implies that it, it's a, it's a, it literally translates as the pitching of tents. 
So most commentators think there were no houses or cities in Tekoa. It was just a place where shepherds lived with their tents and their flocks. So he has no house as such, he has no formal education as such, and yet God calls him to be a prophet. And um, we know that God has a habit of doing that, doesn't he? He calls people who aren't necessarily the best people for the job, as we would see it, even in the church uh, would see it. Uh, God calls people. Um, and uh, I remember, you, you probably have read the story of Gladys Aylward, who uh, went to apply to be a missionary to China. And so she applied and they got turned down and uh, she couldn't read very well. She couldn't write very well. She had no money. Um, you know, what are you going to do in China? The man uh, gently tried to ask her and she said, I just believe God's called me there. Um, and they wouldn't support her because they didn't feel that God had called her. But we know what she did uh, when she got there. So God has this habit of calling people that the world and even sometimes in the church wouldn't call uh, to serve him. But this does not mean Amos was an ignorant man. If you read uh, through his uh, prophecy, you will see that he clearly knows his Bible uh, and he uses his Bible. Uh, even the actual Hebrew words that he uses are uh, words which are detailed words, uh, making us aware that he knows his Bible uh, very, very well. And the fact that uh, he and we, for that matter, have no formal education doesn't mean that it's an excuse for us not to know our Bibles. Um, we ought to be scholars in God's word, uh, whatever we are. Uh, for a text, um, I would uh, point you to uh, chapter 3, verse 2, <coughs> where we read this, these rather solemn words. You only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. Um, so that I'm going to uh, come back to that in a moment, but uh, we'll, we'll have that as our, as our text for the book. So the, the message of Amos then, uh, Amos starts off um, by um, reminding the, his people that he received these words two years before the earthquake. And the imagery of the earthquake seems to pervade the book. This idea of God um, using spectacular uh, words, spectacular imagery um, is kind of, the, kind of the language that Amos uses. And so I think that uh, he, he kind of puts this phrase before the earthquake, not just as a dating thing, but actually to remind people that this is, you know, a, a kind of a seismic message that he's got, just as the earthquake, no doubt, was uh, seismic uh, in Israel. God is, is having a stern word with his people uh, in this book. Um, but the other thing to remind ourselves is, as I've said already, is that we're told that um, uh, the words of Amos, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Isaiah, king of Judah. So he's a southerner. He lives uh, south of Jerusalem and God sends him north to preach uh, and uh, have a message to uh, this the backsliding land of Israel. And as we'll find out in chapter 7, it doesn't go all that well. Uh, Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, one of the idolatrous centres that Jeroboam I had set up 90 years ago, um, he basically tells him to stop spouting and go home. Uh, so uh, he even grasses him up to the king. So Amos isn't particularly well received by the northerners that he gets sent to. Um, but also, uh, by way of context, it's important to, 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 to note that because of these long rains, both in the north and in the south, by what turned out to be quite strong kings, there was a stability of government that there hadn't really been uh, in both the north and the south, particularly in the north. The north had had a lot of rains that had come and gone very quickly, as I'm sure you know, but this rain was uh, a strong rain. Jeroboam II was a strong king. He had some military success. He invaded Syria, captured Damascus, um, and as a result of that, uh, much more of the money and the revenue from the trade routes came into Israel. So as a result of that, the general tenor of the people's lives was that they were wealthy. They were, they were far wealthier than they had been. And as a result, of course, uh, they uh, forgot God, they worshipped idols, um, and they did so with great gusto, it seems, and they sinned without conscience. So this is the situation that Amos has been asked to go and preach. God is basically saying to him, right, leave your sheep, Go into the north and give him the words that I've got for you to say. And 
he's got this difficult job of preaching to a, a, a group of people who for 90 years have completely ignored God and now they feel they don't need him because they are very well off. So how does Amos preach his message? Well, uh, as I said, Amos may be a, a, a humble sheep herder, but he's very astute. He's very clever in the way that he goes about his work. Uh, the book has three parts, uh, three parts to Amos. Firstly, chapters one and two. Um, he starts off by uh, his attention seeking, if you like. He, he gets the attention of his congregation uh, by um, preaching against and pronouncing woes against the nations all around. Uh, so Syria, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, who we've met before in the previous books, Ammon and Moab. So that's a good strategy, isn't it? You know, criticise the enemies of God and his people and you will readily get an audience. Uh, what were the crimes? Uh, if we look in chapter 1 and chapter 2, if you go home and read those chapters, what are their crimes? Well, in today's parlance, we'd call them war crimes. Uh, Syria massacred uh, Gilead, uh, Gaza sold captives uh, to Edom, Tyre joined in in the trafficking of slaves, uh, the war crimes of Edom we've seen before, uh, Ammon joined in the massacre of Gilead, Moab warred uh, against Edom. It was chaos. Uh, there were all of these wars, and, and, and you know, we've, we've seen on our television screens, haven't we, how terrible war is. This was what was going on. And so the first thing that Amos does is he says, right, God is has pronounced this judgment against you nations for what you've done. And so he, he has his audience, if you like. But then, perhaps even more to the delight of the north, Amos turns his attention uh, to Judah, uh, and he uh, pronounces judgment uh, on them as well. Chapter 2, verses 4 uh, and 5. Uh, now, Judah's crimes aren't war crimes. Judah's crimes uh, are not so much uh, breaking international law, if there was such a thing, Judah's crimes were to break God's law. Uh, they've turned away from God. And so as a result of that, he says, Jerusalem is going to have its palaces burned. Well, we know that that had already happened once in the reign of the previous king. Um, and I'm sure, without being too cynical about it, that so far, Amos's message is going down a storm. So he's stood up and he's denounced the foreign nations. He's denounced the south, which rather thinks themselves as much better than the north. And so you can imagine he's got his congregation, he's got his audience. But then, in chapter 2, verse 6, Amos turns his guns on Israel. Having got the attention of everybody, he now has a very, very uh, severe message. Uh, what are Israel's crimes? Well, like Judah, they have broken God's law. Uh, and uh, they sell the righteous for silver, the poor for a pair of sandals, chapter 2, verse 6. They pant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor. You know, what an image that is. You know, that they're so desperate to rob the poor of everything they have. It's like panting after the dust on their head. A man and his father go into the same girl to define my holy name. They lie down on every altar on clothes taken in pledge. So we've got incredible immorality in the guise of this kind of calf worship that's happening at Bethel and Dan. And particularly by now, it seems from Amos, Bethel uh, is the centre of idolatrous worship. The second set of commandments that God gave you, you have broken. The, the commandments to love your neighbour, to look after your neighbour, uh, you have uh, completely ignored. You sold your brothers into slavery uh, and you've done all of these uh, despicable things. And in chapter 2, verse 7, uh, it, it, they basically are being told that they have forgotten the God who, um, who brought them there. Sorry, not verse 7, verses 9 onwards. And God says to them, you know, effectively, who was it that gave you your land in the first place? You know, it wasn't the idols that you're worshipping. It wasn't Molech and it wasn't uh, Baal and it wasn't the Asherah people and all of that. They didn't give you those gods or those lands. I gave you the land. And, and yet you've, for, you've forgotten me. And, uh, and so uh, this is the charge that is brought uh, against uh, Israel. Then in chapters 3 to 6, the second part of the book, uh, Amos delivers several different types of prophecy against Israel. Now, we looked at those in the past. Uh, there's first of all the lawsuit prophecy in chapter 3, uh, but there are also judgment speeches, woe oracles uh, interspersed with 
uh, calls to repentance, which we find mainly uh, interspersed in chapter 5. And then in the last section, chapter 7 to 9, Amos tells of the five visions that he received from God. The first two are threatened punishments, which Amos intercedes for, uh, and uh, one is a plague of locusts, and we know from Joel's prophecy how terrible a thing that was, uh, and the other one there would be a plague of fire. On both of those occasions, uh, we read that he interceded for Israel and God uh, relented. We find that in the early part uh, of chapter 7. We then have this little uh, historical interlude uh, where uh, he's told in no uncertain terms to go home. But then we have these other uh, visions, the vision of the plumb line and the vision of the uh, summer fruit. Now both of these are really of the same meaning. And these uh, judgments, uh, even though he may well have prayed, he can't uh, turn God's back. Uh, God, he can't turn God back from from following those from following those through. Uh, the plumb line measures straightness. If anybody's ever tried to put a wallpaper on a wall, um, how are you going to get your line straight? Well, you kind of stick a, a line at the top with a lead weight at the bottom, and that's your straight line, uh, and away you go. And that's how you, in those days, you would build houses. How do you know your house is straight? Well, you put the plumb line down and measure it. And a house that was out of square uh, is fit only for demolish, demolition. It's not going to stand up. And Israel are like a house out of square. They are measured and they are found to be a crooked people. Uh, and so that's the, the, the vision uh, in chapter 7. And then in chapter 8, we have the vision of the summer fruit. Well, what is summer fruit all about? Summer fruit is ready to be picked, isn't it? It's ready to be eaten. It's the time for consummation. Uh, and Israel are ripe for judgment uh, because of their ways. And he, Amos explains in chapter 8 uh, why that is uh, the case. And although Israel are a very profitable country, as we said, they're a very wealthy country, um, they've got great stability, they've had political success, they've had military success, yet uh, assuming, when I think it's fairly safe to assume, that Amos is preaching in the latter halves of these two long reigns, um, it's only 40 years or so before the northern kingdom of Israel is taken away and destroyed. And so this is one of the series of, of kind of final warnings, if you like, to Israel uh, that the prophets have sent. Amos isn't the only one, of course. We'll see that there are others. But then in chapter 9, to finish the book, there is a, a complete turnaround uh, of uh, tone and, and emphasis. Um, uh, and we, we also see this in other prophecies that, you know, uh, it all looks really doom and gloom and terrible uh, uh, judgments. But then there is this picture of hope there will be a remnant there will be a return and the message in chapter 9 is that God will not then nor ever cast off his people Israel like Jeremiah with Judah later on so with Amos and Israel judgment is coming uh, and it's a terrible judgment that's going to come Samaria is going to be uh, dismantled the people are going to be taken away into captivity many will lose their lives it's going to be a complete dismantling of the nation yet there is going to be a remnant, yet there will be a return. And uh, But when it returns, uh, as we find out from the New Testament, it won't just be uh, physical Israel, um, but uh, the church will be Israel made up of uh, Jewish believers and Gentile believers. And uh, James, the brother of the Lord, gives uh, a quotation from Acts chapter 9 in Acts 15, where the church are debating well, what do we do with these Gentiles? You know, there's loads of them being, you know, converted. What do we do with them? Do we subject them to circumcision? Do we subject them to the law? And James, after a great debate, stands up and said, well, actually, if you know your Amos, then you know this is what's going to be prophesied. This is the fulfilment of the prophecy, that God is going to rebuild his church. It's been demolished, it's been scattered, but now God is building his church. And so, using Amos chapter 9, the church in Jerusalem said they would not uh, impose circumcision and other legal obligations on believers, but they were to come as they are. So there's an overview of the book, uh, but perhaps just to get a more detailed flavour of it, I'd like us to read chapter 3, and we're going to con consider that in a little more detail so that we um, hopefully get a good understanding of what the book is all about.
So perhaps we'll uh, read chapter 3 together. Uh, It's 15 verses. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Will a young lion cry out if he's dead, if he has caught nothing? Will a bird fall into a snare on the earth when there is no trap for it? Will a snare spring up from the earth if it has caught nothing at all? If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people be afraid? If there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to the servants, the prof- to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? Proclaim in the palaces of Ashdod, and in the palaces of the land of Egypt, and say, Assemble on the mountains of Samaria, see great tumults in her midst, and the oppressed within her, for they do not know to do right, says the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, An adversary shall be all around the land. He shall sap your strength from you, and your palaces shall be plundered. Thus says the Lord, As a shepherd takes from the mouth of a lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out, who dwell in Samaria, in the corner of a bed, and on the edge of a couch. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, says the Lord God, the God of hosts, that in the day I punish Israel for their transgressions, I will also visit destruction on the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. I will destroy the winter house along with the summer house. The houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, says the Lord. So let's let's have a look at uh, chapter 3, um, because I think this is the pivotal chapter uh, of the book. Uh, and in doing so, we will aim to look at the message as it was relevant then uh, and as it is uh, relevant now. Uh, now, uh, if you've uh, followed uh, much of what we've been saying, uh, then one of the things that uh, comes out of the, the book of the Twelve is that there are different types of prophetic speech. Sometimes there are woe or- oracles, sometimes there are judgment oracles. Here we have what we call a lawsuit prophecy or a prophetic lawsuit uh, and so uh, we, we looked at this before but I think we'll look at, at this again and uh, we have the, the same characteristics in this lawsuit first of all we have God is the accuser or the plaintiff um, because he says in chapter 3 verse 1 uh, hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you O children of Israel. So God is calling uh, or charging the children of Israel with a crime, with sin. They are the accused. The charge is read out. What is the charge? Verse 2. You only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for your iniquities. Uh, And so that's the charge. The defendant then is cross-examined in verse 2. Three to six, we'll come to look at that in a minute. Uh, The prosecuting lawyer is affirmed. He's the prophet in verses seven and eight. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to the servants of prophet. A lion has roared, he will not fear. The Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy. So Amos, if you like, stands uh, as the prosecuting uh, lawyer. And then in verse nine, we have the witnesses. Okay, this is why it's a court scene, you know, because there are witnesses. He says, proclaim in the palaces of Ashdod and in the palaces of the land of Egypt and say, assemble on the mountains of Samaria. Come and look at what uh, is going on. Uh, And then judgment is pronounced in verses 11 to 15. It's an open and shut case. Israel have no defence. And so this is what chapter three is all about. It carries on in chapters uh, four, uh, which is a summation of uh, Israel's past, 
So we're, we're in the present in chapter 3. Chapter 4 uh, is a summation of, of all Israel have done and their, and their sins of the past. Chapters 5 and 6 is the Lord grieving over what is going to happen. So if we break up chapter 3 then let's have some headings. So the first heading that I have for you is verses 1 and 2 and that is that God's charge is fair. God's charge is is fair. Uh, and uh, this phrase here, the word of the Lord, is uh, opens each of the sections uh, of this second part of the book. So it is in chapter uh, 3 verse 1, chapter 4 verse 1, chapter 5 verse 1. God says, hear this word. This is God speaking. Yes, he's speaking through a man, Amos, this unfashionable shepherd, uh, this poor peasant who picks sycamore fruit for a living. But it is God's word. It's his declaration. God has something to say and his people had better pay attention. Uh, and it reminds us, doesn't it, that the Bible is not an optional book for us to read. And as Christians, we can kind of uh, forget that sometimes. You know, we can read all sorts of other books, but we forget that the Bible is not an optional book for us to read. We can't have a, a Christian life where we go, well, maybe I'll read the Bible and maybe I won't. We have to read the Bible. It's God's word. Uh, and it shouts out to us, uh, about the past uh, and the present, uh, as well as the future. Hear this word. When we read the Bible, God is speaking. We must never forget that. Even if we're looking at passages and trying to grapple with things and going, well, what does this really mean? Nonetheless, God is speaking. And sometimes Christians, and maybe we've done it ourselves, you know, that we say, well, you know, I keep praying to God, I keep asking God, but I don't get an answer. God is not answering me. God is silent. But one of the questions to ask in those times is, how much time are we spending with God in his word? Because that's primarily where he speaks, isn't it? Israel's problem is they'd long given up listening to God. That's why they were going to be in the mess that they were going to be in, in around 40 years' time. Uh, they had no time for God. Uh, and that's why that they were going to be in difficulties that they would never really understand or overcome. Our own nation has been blessed for over... 500 years with God's word, hasn't it, in its own language. The preaching of God's word, the explaining of God's word, you know, from the Lollards onwards. And yet we now live in a society, for all the amount of Bibles that may be published and printed year on year, we live in a society that's spiritually illiterate. That our country, our people, our nation, our families, our friends, our neighbours, they don't know their Bible. So we've said God's charge is fair in verses 1 and 2, but why is God's charge fair? Why is it right that God's charge against Israel is correct? And, and the answer is because he knows the facts of the case. He knows his people. He says to them, you know, I, uh, children of Israel against the whole family. So he's not just really talking about the north, he's also talking about the south because he's talking about the whole of Israel. I brought all of you up from the land of Egypt. And he says, you, you only uh, have I known. You know, he, he saved them, didn't he? He rescued them from a terrible bondage that they were in. Uh, he, he appointed them for his own. He told them that he'd chosen them to be his people. And he invites them to walk with him. And this idea of God's relationship with Israel is actually very, very important. Uh, because it really is the spring of nearly everything that you will read in the Old Testament. As a man called John Goldingay, who says the history of the Old Testament is really the history of God inviting Israel to walk with him. I don't know if they've ever thought of the Old Testament in those terms. But if you read the Old Testament, it's the history of God inviting Israel to walk with him. How does he do that? Well, he starts off, doesn't he, by giving them commands to live by, doesn't he? He says, right, if you're going to live before me, this is how you live. So he gives them the Ten Commandments. Uh, so they have a moral law, if you want to call it that, but they also have their sacrificial law, what we might call the Levitical law, and they have their civic law. So there are laws of the, of the land uh, that, that, that they have to abide by. So they were given commands to live. This is how you should live. These are the rules. But then he gave them examples to copy, examples to follow, didn't he? There are many good and godly examples that we read of, aren't there, in the Old Testament. You know, whether it be Joseph, whether it be uh, Abraham, where they're not shown to be perfect men, but they are in the main good and godly examples. Uh, David, Joshua, and, and so on. 
They were also given values and principles to incorporate into their life. So the law wasn't just a load of do's and don'ts. There were principles in there which they could look at and go, okay, well, the law doesn't actually explain what I do in this situation, but the principles of the law and the principles of the teaching and, and all of it that is there, uh, well, they, they give me values uh, to incorporate into my life. This is how I should live in terms of the sort of person I am. But they were also taught in the Old Testament, and, you, and uh, this is really part of the wisdom literature, I suppose, in, 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 in the main, is that they were to uh, see that their life was a life lived before God. So as you walked along as an Israelite, as you lived your life as an Israelite, you would have been very conscious, if you knew your scriptures, that you were living your life before God. You remember Elijah's um, phrase that he uses a number of times. He says, as the Lord lives before whom I stand. You know, he was very aware that he lived his life before God. And they were given teaching and ethics and examples of how to apply the law into their character. So not only this is the sort of person uh, that, I, that I am, uh, this is my very nature. This is, this is not just how I live, but this is the reason that I live this way. So that's really what the Old Testament is. It's, it's God's invitation uh, for Israel to walk with him. And he shows them how to do it, uh, what the rules are, uh, and so on. So this is why the charge is fair, because he says to them in verse 2, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Yeah, I didn't do this for anybody else. Right? I didn't invite the Amorites uh, to walk with me. I haven't invited the Edomites to walk with me. Uh, I just invited you. It's you that I set my love on. It's you that I have cherished. It's you that I have called my son. And yet, what's your response? Your response is, you don't care. You are in ungrateful. And, and the word known that he uses is, is not like a, a head knowledge. It, it has a, it's a very rich word, meaning uh, observing, uh, caring, taking notice of, recognising, even... Uh, to regard as kinsfolk. And this word known is used uh, throughout the scriptures to portray that. Psalm 1 verse 6, Psalm 144 verse 3 uh, talks about the Lord knowing his people. Uh, Jesus uses the same word in John 10 14 and, and 1 Timothy, sorry, 2 Timothy 2 19 quotes the same word. In, in each case, when God talks about knowing his people, it is a picture of intimacy, it's a picture of care. But Israel don't want God's law. They have abandoned God's law. And at Bethel in particular, there was this centre of idol worship, which completely went against everything that God uh, had asked them to do. Here we are in a period of Israel being very rich and very prosperous. And we know from the days of the judges, don't we? When everything was going well, what did they do? They went off and followed idols. And when the, the enemy came in and overcame the land, what did they do? Cried out to God and said, oh, we're sorry, we'll, we'll follow you from now on. So God sends them a judge and it's all white for a while. And then what happens? They get rich and prosperous and they go back to the idols. And this was their history. And here it is now, these hundreds of years later, but now it's kind of crystallised and hardened so that they just will not, cannot uh, repent. So what God charges them with, in other words, ingratitude and turning away from him is fair. It, it's exactly what's happened. But because this is a court of law, uh, we're going to have some evidence. So the evidence is given in verses 3 to 10. Now, you might think this is a rather strange way of giving evidence. And, and what are all these questions about, these uh, rhetorical questions? Uh, and, it, it's, uh, and Amos uses this device to increase the seriousness of the charge. Before Israel can kind of refute the charges, or before Israel can kind of, you know, turn their nose up and say, well, we don't care about the charges, he asks them these questions, which uh, are what we call truisms. In other words, they're rhetorical questions. The answer is obvious. Okay. Why, why does he do that? Uh, he does that uh, to, to um, emphasise uh, the fact that God has brought these charges, uh, and if they weren't true, then he wouldn't have brought them. So as these statements are true, and so obviously true, so God's charge against them is true. And so we have these, these kind of truisms, these rhetorical questions. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Obviously not. 
Will the lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? No, he doesn't. A lion roars after he's captured his prey. Uh, the young lion the same. Will a bird fall into a snare on the earth when there is no trap? Well, quite clearly not. So these are the questions that, that Amos is putting to them. And, and they are overlapping and emphasising the fact that uh, God's charge is fair. That as God's charge is true, so these statements are true. And there is also teaching here as well. Um, the Lord is going to roar, he says. The trumpet is going to blast. God is speaking and he will speak. Uh, calling Israel to repentance. Still, he's calling Israel to repentance. How is he doing that? Because he keeps on sending prophets. And, and we know that, that Amos isn't going to be the last one. We've got Micah to come. We've got Hosea to come. Um, you know, we've got other prophets to, to come. Isaiah is going to come later and overlap and so on. And faithful preaching, even when it's loathed by the people, is a kindness from God. Of course, it isn't seen by that, isn't it? You go out to the, uh, to the streets and say to people, what do you think of somebody preaching from the Bible? And you'll probably get short shrift, won't you? But nonetheless, it is a kindness from God. How do we know that? Because if you have a look at, uh, just briefly, at Amos chapter 9, we have these very, very sobering words. Amos 9. Sorry, Amos 8, verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist, boldness on every head, and I will make mourning like an only sun, and its end like a bitter day. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from north, sea to sea, from north to east, they shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. What's the worst thing God can do to a nation? It isn't famine, says Amos. It isn't, uh, no, it isn't a lack of food or a lack of water. It's a famine of the hearing of God's word. When God takes away his preachers from a nation, faithful preachers who preach the truth, that is a curse on that nation. That's the worst thing that God can do. That's what Amos uh, is teaching us. Amos 3 verse 2, as we said, is the text of the book. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Consider your privileges. Consider all I've done for you. Consider how I've shown my love for you. And what's your response? We don't care. We don't want you. And so since you've had those greater privileges, you have a greater responsibility. You have a greater accountability. You are accountable for your sins because you should have known better. You had the law. You had all this teaching. You're accountable for breaking God's law, God's heart rather, because you've walked away from him. And it's a picture of a child and the parent, isn't it? You know that the child has done, that the parent's done everything for the child, but the child walks away. I think that's when the Lord Jesus is teaching on the parable of the um, lost son that you know the Jewish mind would have would have thought of, of, of passages like this that, that Israel have been accused of walking away from God just like this prodigal did, and he says you're accountable for plundering the defenseless <coughs> because you should have had a heart like God as He's shown it to you uh, in His Word. What is the summary? Of all the evidence, what's the final concluding statement of the lawyer? Chapter 3, verse 10. For they do not know to do right, says the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. Israel's moral compass, if you want to call it that, or their spiritual compass, was so damaged that they now have no idea how to please God. They have no idea how to walk with God as he invited them to all those years ago. Violence covers them like a cloak. Robbery is the language of the people. It's, it's kind of a given that if I can steal from you, then I will. And so daily, national life in Israel, particularly for the poor, uh, for the godly, as we've read, is simply awful. And so God is saying in chapter 3, verse 10, that God has had enough. And then the third part of the chapter is the verdict is proclaimed to all. Verses 11 
to 15. Actually, uh, it also really should be verses 9 to 15. There's an overlap there. Because, again, using this imagery of the court, the nations are summoned to witness God's verdict. He says, proclaim in the palaces of Ashdod and in the palaces of the land of Egypt. Now, why does God pick those? Who, what does he mean by that? Well, of course, Ashdod uh, is the, the head of the old Philistines, isn't it? The, the, the old enemy. Uh, Egypt, of course, is the very nation which, uh, if you like, gave birth to Israel, you know, when God took them out uh, of Egypt. And so God summons, as it were, these old adversaries to the courthouse to hear and exclaim and wonder at the verdicts. And in very poetic language Amos is using, he's, he's basically kind of like bringing uh, the Philistines and bringing the, the Egyptians into the court. And there, you could have this picture of them coming into the court and saying, well, is, is, is God really condemning Israel? I mean, he, he normally condemns us, but he's condemning Israel. Is he, is he going to punish his own people? How is that possible? When for so many years he's kept them and protected them and preserved them in miraculous ways. And you can imagine the, the Philistine and the Egyptian listening to this and, and wondering and trembling. We read that judgment may begin at the house of God, but it doesn't end there. So if the judgment is going to be so severe for Israel, what's it going to be for the other nations? And God makes it very clear what he's going to do uh, in these last verses. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an adversary shall be all around the land. Israel's strength uh, will be sapped. Uh, uh, the palaces in Samaria that stored up the plunder uh, of the poor uh, is uh, going to be likewise uh, plundered. And... Um, uh, <coughs> what I should have, um, uh, have mentioned is that uh, when God uh, summons these nations uh, to, to um, uh, in verse 11, when he says an adversary shall be all around them, what that is, is a picture of is that Samaria was built on a hill, but in the midst of a valley. So if these nations were summoned, as it were, to watch, they could come to the tops of the mountains, look down into Samaria, and see what God is doing. That's this imagery of the adversary shall be all around their land. And, and so Israel is going to be consumed like a wolf eats a lamb with just a remnant surviving. It's a rather horrid picture. Um, as a shepherd takes from the mouth of the lion two legs uh, or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out. Why, why does God use that rather graphic image? Well, uh, it's telling again because both in Hebrew custom, which we can read of in Genesis 39, verse 39, and in law, Exodus 22, verse 13, if a shepherd had lost a lamb, uh, he, if he found a bit that had been eaten, whether it be as small as an ear or the legs or whatever, he could take it to the host and he wouldn't have to pay for it. Uh, he, the reason for that he would took the ear or the legs was to uh, prove its loss and not be held accountable. And so what God eventually is saying by using this imagery is, I'm going to send the, the enemies of Israel and they're not going to be held accountable for what they do to you. I'm going to allow them to chastise you because they're doing it for me. I'm not going to hold them accountable for them destroying you. Those who do escape, uh, will do, the remnant, will do by God's grace uh, alone. Uh, and then we have um, uh, this, this little strange picture um, so shall the children of Israel be taken out who dwell in Samaria in the corner of a bed and on the edge of a couch. Now this strange image of the couch is reference to the fact that Jeroboam, uh, second, the current king of Israel, has recently conquered Damascus, uh, the capital of Syria, and it made rich. And so this, this picture of the couch is a picture of luxury. Uh, and yet, he says, Syria will witness the destruction of Samaria. In verse 14, he says, In that day I punish Israel for their transgressions. I will also visit destruction on the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off. And uh, this, sent, this is the centre of idolatry that has proven such a, uh, a weakening point to Israel. Uh, the very first king, Jeroboam, after the split in 931, when Rehoboam took the south and Jeroboam 
the son of Nebat took the north. He made these golden calves, didn't he? He made them at Bethel in the south and he made them at Dan in the north. And um, over the years, it wasn't just animals that were sacrificed. They began to practice all the wicked, idolatrous practices of all the nations around. And so God specifically says, you know, not only is Samaria going to be taken down, so will this dreadful, wicked, sinful uh, altar that Jeroboam put up 90 years ago. It's going to be destroyed. And then he says, to conclude, I will destroy the winter house, uh, which are the kind of houses that were tucked into a south-facing uh, hill uh, for shelter. He said, I'm going to destroy the summer house, which were normally placed on the top of the hills, uh, so they could face the, the east or the north and get a refreshing breeze. So both ends of the kind of luxury scale, if you like, I'm going to take away. I'm going to destroy the uh, ivory palaces. Uh, we read, for example, they had building himself palaces of ivory and houses of ivory. Israel as a society is going to be dismantled from top to bottom. And this is the judgment that is proclaimed. And we know that within a generation, within 40 years or so, Israel was taken away. Samaria was besieged and destroyed and taken away. And so we have to close then by saying, well, what are the lessons of Amos uh, for us? You know, this is not an easy book to read, both in terms of its message and the style that it's written. So, so what can we take away from it? Well, there are several things. First of all, we've, we've mentioned it already, so I'm not going to go over it in great detail again. Uh, James uses this passage uh, in Acts chapter 9 to remind the church that it was always God's plan that the true Israel are not the bloodline of Israel, but are the, the spiritual believers, those who have put their trust in God, both Jews and Gentiles. None is more important than the other. Uh, sometimes when we, we kind of hear... Uh, preachers it's almost as if uh, Israel in, in all of its sin and hardness of heart uh, is, is somehow more uh, dear to God than his church that isn't the case Christ died for the church and it's the church that is the true Israel of God but it is made up of Jewish and Gentile believers so this grafting in of the Gentiles uh, is uh, prophesied in Amos and applied in the New Testament Secondly, Amos reminds us that there's always going to be a remnant. I mean, this is a pretty severe book of judgment. But even then, at the end of the book, we read there is always going to be a remnant. And this idea of the remnant pervades all the prophets. It's there in Isaiah, it's there in, in the others. Both Israel in the north, Judah in the south, always had a remnant of godly believers. Even in the dark times, before the Lord Jesus Christ came, where for 400 years there'd been no written word, uh, there were still a godly remnant, weren't there? We read in the uh, nativity story of these godly people, people like Anna, people like Zechariah, um, and, and of course Mary and Elizabeth and, uh, 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 and Simeon. They, 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 there were these people who were still a godly people. There is always a godly remnant. Thirdly, Amos reminds us that idolatry is a terrible thing. Their, Israel's punishment was primarily for their idolatry, for their turning away from God and worshipping idols. Uh, and we might think that that's finished now, but idolatry did not end, did it, with Israel's capture. The church is still plagued with idolatry, and God still hates idolatry. And so as we look at the book of Amos and we read of the terrible judgments there for idolatry we have to ask ourselves you know am i an idolater am i an idolater 1 john 5 21 warns us to keep away from idolatry so it's quite clear that it's that's it's still there some people think well idolatry is confined to those churches that you know have statues on and paintings and stained glass windows and all of these kind of so-called aids to worship but it's not in just those churches is it colossians 3 verse 5 paul uh, gives a whole list of sins that can endanger us and he ends by saying and covetousness which is idolatry covetousness is the spiritual idolatry that we have to be on our guard against covetous is wanting what god has not given us and, you know, it can be so insidious that James 4, verse 2 to 3, 
he, he writes about not only warning us against it, but he reminds his people that they're even praying for it. He says, God isn't answering these prayers because you're asking for things that you're going to spend on your pleasure. You can't ask for things like that. You can't behave like that. But these people were so unaware that they were idolaters. So let Amos encourage us to examine our hearts and lives to see if we are a covetous people. Are we being idolatrous? Are we wanting things, working for things, demanding things from God that God has said we shan't, we cannot have? True worship is the opposite of idolatry, isn't it? Let us be those who worship God in spirit and in truth. Let's be those who worship God wholeheartedly and obey him fully. Following on from that, Amos reminds us to beware the dangers of materialism. Um, if you, if you look at the next verses in chapter 4, uh, we have this extremely surprising statement where he says, Hear this word of the Lord, you cows of Bashan. Who are the cows of Bashan? Well, they are the, the rich wives uh, of Israel. And uh, it's not very flattering, but uh, we read that these women of Israel lived for money, crushed the poor, uh, demanded wine. And the danger for the rich is always to forget our need of God, isn't it? Now, the proverb says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Why not? Well, because if I have too much, then I might forget the God who gave these things to me. Now we may say, well, I wouldn't regard myself as a rich person. Um, but I think it's true that we have much more than our forebears, our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents could ever have dreamed of, don't we? We're used to it. We're used to a lifestyle that they could only ever dreamed of and it can easily make us spiritually slack uh, and sloppy so we're to beware of materialism amos also teaches us to be aware of so-called social justice now we have to be a little bit careful there because we know that sometimes in the church they can leave off preaching and get so involved in in caring for uh, the poor and for all of that that they forget what their actually primary purpose is. The primary purpose of the church is to preach the gospel. But we are meant to do good as we can, as we are able. We are to do good to all kinds of people. James reminds us also that we are to do what we can. Uh, and then nextly, we must expect opposition to the word. Amos experienced that. Uh, in chapter 7, he's told basically to shut up and go home. Uh, we don't want you here. Go back to your south. We, you're not interested in your message. Uh, go. And we know that other prophets, of course, uh, had far worse than that to, to contend with. And we are now beginning to live in an age, aren't we, where the word of God, not only is it not read, but it's not wanted. Uh, it's not preached because it's not wanted. And so we have to recognise that even so-called religious people um, won't want the message of God. Uh, political people won't want the message of God. Jeroboam had no time for God. That's why Amaziah uh, wrote to him to tell on Amos. And finally, particularly in the last chapter of Amos, Amos reminds us that the world is like a little ball that is held in God's hand. God is over all and almighty. He is over all and above all. And his will will always be done because he never ceases to be God. He never ceases to be the all-powerful one. Mankind at best, or mankind at worst, can only ever fulfil the purposes of the counsel of God. And so Amos reminds us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus. Amen.